Oh, I know so many of you are going to love today's episode with Dr. Robert Glover. So Dr. Glover is the author of No More Mr. Nice Guy, a proven plan for getting what you want in love, sex, and life. Now, if you're a female listening, I got two things to say to you. One is the chances of you having this nice guy syndrome he's talking about are pretty freaking high. You can see all over the episode. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's so been me so much of my life, still, still battling it a lot, honestly, but also in, in your dating relationships, you may, or your, your husband, even like you may see some of this stuff. I, I definitely was all over the place. So I think a lot of us need to start thinking about these things. Like, are we being nice, quote unquote, nice? but actually that's not the real reality of what's going on. And how is that messing up your life? How is that getting in the way in relationships? And Dr. Glover is so wonderful to listen to. He's so self-aware. He shares his own story of overcoming what he calls nice guy syndrome. Um, it's so, so good. So lots of food for thought here that I know you guys are going to get a lot from. Um, and just a little background on Dr. Glover. He's an internationally recognized authority on this nice guy syndrome. He's a frequent guest on radio talk shows, um, has been in a lot of publications. He has his book, online classes, workshops, podcasts, blogs, cons consultations, therapy groups. So he is living, breathing, doing this stuff all day, every day. He's so good at teaching about it. Um, so I know you guys are just really going to honestly fall in love with Dr. Glover. He's just got such a great way of sharing this message. Um, and it's something really interesting for all of us to think about, especially those of us who know that we can tend to be too nice, right? <laughs> What's really behind that? So we're going to dig in. He's going to give you some real practical application, some homework. He actually gives you a homework assignment of what you can do. That is so good. He's such an excellent coach. Um, so we'll go ahead and jump right into it. Here is Dr. Robert Glover. All right. So Robert, can you please enlighten my audience? Please enlighten us today with what is nice guy syndrome? <laughs> All right. That's a good place to start. And, um, and it's good to get a definition of it because I know a lot of times people pick up my book, No More Mr. Nice Guy, and they think, why would somebody write a book teaching men to be not nice? There's already, there's already <laughs> enough not nice uh, guys out there. And so um, I'm, I'm going to define it, even though I primarily now work with men and, and my book was directed at men. A lot of women like it. I know you have a lot of women listeners. So I'm, I'm going to also address it. Nice guy, but we'll weave in nice girl as well, because there's a, there's a lot of overlap, a lot of similarity. But in a nutshell, a nice guy or a nice girl is a person who doesn't believe they are OK just as they are. And, and this is a deep emotional belief, not just kind of thoughts in our head. It's a deep emotional belief. I'm not okay just as I am. And so therefore they try to do two things. Number one is they try to become what they think other people want them to be so that they can be liked and loved and get their needs met. And they hide anything about them that they think might get a negative reaction from anybody else, whether it be getting punished or scolded or left, abandoned, whatever. So, so nice guys, nice girls are basically walking around like chameleons, kind of, you know, licking their finger and holding it up in the air, seeing which way the wind's blowing and say, well, I can't, I better become that, or I better not do that, or I better hide that, or I better look more like that. And so they, they, they're, they're really very unauthentic and, and not particularly honest. And so we, we kind of tee that up to what's the problem with being a nice guy. Yeah. And, and, and the biggest part of it is, is, is that typically they're, they're, they're dependent on external validation. They tend to avoid conflict. They tend to want to be liked and approved of. Um, they often, they're often dishonest. They won't really say what they really want, what they really think, what they really feel, if they think it'll get a, a negative reaction. And, um, and often because they don't do a very good job of, of taking good care of themselves because they're so busy taking care of everybody else. They tend to get resentment build up for us. Mm -hmm. and, and that comes out in some not so nice ways, either roundabout uh, passive aggressive behaviors yep. or, or, or what I call in, in my book, victim pukes, where, you know, the stuff is just built up for so long and something happens, somebody says something and boom, it just all comes yep. puking out. So, so that's just a little snapshot of the Oof. nice guy. Oof. I, I recognize a lot of those qualities in myself back before I did any of my own personal work. I mean, chameleon all the way and, and prided myself on being nice. And I've also dated uh -huh. people in this. I'm, I'm, I'm sure all of us listening are like either recognizing some of those qualities in ourselves or people that we've been close to. And I guess my, the first place my mind goes is, you know, what, 
what leads to those feelings of not being okay the way I am? Can you give any examples in childhood possibly of things that might cause you to end up down this road? Well, and, and that is typically where it starts for, for everybody. And so I'll just kind of do a little uh, child development 101. Um, when, when we, you know, when we pop out, when we come into this world, um, we, of course, are very dependent, very immature. Uh, many of our operating systems are not online yet. And, and perhaps most significantly, our brain is very underdeveloped. The, the primary part of the human brain that is operating at birth is down on the brain stem and it's the amygdala. And it's all about survival. It's, it controls respiration, heartbeat, and the, our, our flight, fight, freeze mechanism. Now, the theory is, is that the, the amygdala is about the size of our little fingernail. Like I said, down on, on the brain stem, which is all as is very old part of, of the human brain. And mm -hmm. we share that with a lot of other animals. Mm -hmm. The theory is, is that it stores up emotional memory. So when a baby has any kind of painful or negative experience, you know, they're cold and, uh, or they're hungry or, they, you know, they're, 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 their diaper's dirty or they just need to be held or picked up. Uh, any negative experience doesn't mean that they're actually being abused or, or, or hurt, but to the child, they feel everything intensely and they're narcissistic by nature. They, they, without thinking, because the, the, the prefrontal cortex, the thinking reasoning part of our brain doesn't start coming on to like two years old or later and doesn't finish fully developing in, in men, at least about 25 years old. But that part that just measures survival, what, what do I need to survive is fully online and it stores up emotional memory of our earliest experiences. So whatever a child experiences, they tend to believe they are the cause of it. That's that grandiose narcissistic wiring. I mean, every, every infant is that way It's part of the survival mechanism. So these emotional beliefs get stored up, as I said, in an emotional part of the brain. And that becomes our machine language. We, you know, we use a computer analogy. It's the DOS, it's the operating system. And then later on, as more parts of the brain come online, those are like the apps. Those are the applications running on top of the machine language of our emotional belief system. Now, that emotional belief system, I mean, I'm a therapist. But unfortunately, for example, doing therapy can, can uncover the, some of the manifestations of those emotional beliefs, but because they don't have words and they don't have picture memory, it's just emotion, we, you know, we can hunt all of our life trying to find out what was the thing said to me when I was three months old? What was the thing that happened? Mm -hmm. We won't ever find it, mm -hmm. but we will find the emotional traces of that experience. Now, the, the amygdala is wired into every other part of the brain. Like I said, those are all the apps running on top of it. So even how we think about ourselves, how we view the world, how we view our place in the world, all are controlled by those emotional memories. And everything we think, everything we perceive, we believe is 100% accurate. Accurate of who we are, how the world works, how people think of us. We, we, we all, every human person thinks every, every thought they have is 100% accurate until we learn to become observers of them and go, oh, actually some of those are pretty bizarre and pretty distorted, uh, you know, pretty crazy. And, and you know, hopefully you're not, you're, you're not in your head. Hopefully most of us get to the point where we can be the watcher and observer and yeah. witness of the noise in our head, not the believer of it. Yeah. But every human being has, has that internal operating system. Now, what, what every infant does in a very immature way is two things, is they develop protection mechanisms. Well, first of all, I'll say they'll develop really self-soothing anxiety management mechanisms to try to feel better when these painful things are happening. Maybe they learn, maybe they cry a lot. Maybe they don't cry. Maybe they withdraw. Um, maybe they, you know, throw fits. Uh, lots of different things. And the second thing that infants do is they try using no thinking, only emotion and, and very immature brain and systems. They try to develop systems to prevent these painful experiences from happening again. Mm. Okay. So fast forward, here we are two adults looking at each other on Zoom and adults listening every one of us has that emotional operating system that was developed at a very early immature stage of our life it then influenced what we do to try to manage our uncomfortable feelings when we experience them and it developed mechanisms to try to protect us from those things happening to us again and we carry all of that into adulthood and all of the apps in our brain the reasoning parts of our brain um, now operate 
from that system that we developed at a really early age. So being a nice guy or a nice girl is just one of many. Being oppositionally defiant might be another one. You know, just saying, fuck it, you know, might be another one. You know, turning to addictions, yeah. uh, turning to uh, success or achievement. Th these are all just the things we try to do to not feel bad and to try and feel good. Mm. You know, I, I was, I love that in the beginning, you talked about, uh, being a liar, <laughs> being dishonest. And, uh -huh. you know, I, um, before this podcast, I have a daughter who's almost 15 and we were kind of talking about this and she's like, Oh, have you seen the Reddit about nice guys? It's so funny. And she's like showing me all these little things on Reddit about like uh -huh. nice, nice guys. And, um, and we were talking about it and she's very intuitive and, and so am I. And I was like, and I was saying, you know, for me, when someone's being over overly nice intuitively I can feel the dishonesty like I mm -hmm. it doesn't feel like safe energy to me it feels like something weird is going on here in which you are saying something but you I can tell you don't really mean it and it feels like there's a neediness coming from you like you need me to like what you're saying but deep down I'm feeling like a little bit like I want to take a step back because I don't trust your energy <laughs> you know and yeah. I and I for me Oh man. I mean, childhood was crazy for me, right? Like I had a very challenging childhood with a mentally ill mom as my sole provider. Mm. And, mm. um, a lot, she would just kind of peace out a lot and leave the older kids in charge. I was the youngest of five. Um, my oldest brother was very abusive to me and it was definitely, I learned so many coping mechanisms as a yeah. little kid to be like, so instantly, you know, kindergarten, I was like the superstar child and did everything right. And did all my homework and did extra credit. And, you know, so I learned all these ways to get people to like me. Sure. Um, and it ruined my life, honestly, at one point, because way down the road, I got into a really unhealthy relationship in which I claimed to have been manipulated by a narcissist. But when I went and did work with it afterwards, um, what my coach helped me see was that I was lying. He was suggesting that I do certain things and I would go along with them and to get him to love me. <laughs> and deep inside, I'm like, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? What? Uh? And so she pointed out to me, she's like, did you tell him that you didn't want to do that? And I'm like, no. And she's like, so you lied to him. <laughs> And I'm mm -hmm. like, wait, what? Wait, no, wait. Oh, <laughs> I'm a, I'm a good person. I don't tell lies. Right. I'm the, I'm the victim here. I, I, I'm yes. nice. I'm good. You know? And it was like just what I needed. So I love that you're kind of turning the table and getting us to look at our own behaviors that were, were, were masking a lot of really unhealthy emotional behaviors under nice. And there is a neediness there. So I was wondering if we could kind of dive a little bit back more into what it looks like, you know, maybe some stories that you've seen, or what does it look like um, on the daily when you're operating as a nice guy and how that can like really ruin your relationships. Sure. Well, let's, let's do that in the context of something I call covert contracts. And I, and I talk mm -hmm. about these in the book and a lot of people said that was like the, you know, gym that they, they took mm -hmm. out of the book. Mm -hmm. When you were talking about, you know, you can feel people's insincerity. You and I were talking a little bit before we started, I live down in Mexico. And so, you know, here, here I am, you know, a, a, a white guy in, in a, a tourist town in Mexico. And yeah, yeah, I'm walking down the street and, you know, some, some Mexican guys, you know, you know, is, Hey friend, hola amigo. And, you know, and it starts a conversation. And my first thought is, what does he want? He wants something. Right. And, and that's true. We can sense that with the nice guy because he's, he has an agenda. Now he may not, or she may not be even aware of the agenda, but one of the things that, and this is, was really helpful for me. And I'm a recovering nice guy. I mean, everything I write and talk about nice guys comes out of both my own personal experience. And I'm still, I'm still working on my nice guy stuff. Uh, for example, I still have a coach. I'm still in a men's group. I still Love work it. on it. And I've worked with, um, you know, thousands of men and women, you know, over the last 30 years uh, around these issues. But the covert contract is this, um, is th and the nice guy tends to have three of them. And they're all uh, if then propositions. They all are manipulative by nature and they all have strings attached. Now, the nice guy often is completely unconscious of these covert contracts. Is one reason why they're called covert. The nice guy may, may not be aware of his contracts or her contracts, but the other people definitely are completely unaware of the contract. 
So here's the three covert contracts. The first one is if, um, if I'm a good guy or if I'm a good girl, uh, I will be liked and loved. And, and often with men, that gets translated. I work with a lot of men around dating and a relationship. For a lot of men that goes, well, if I'm a good guy, then women will like me and want to be my girlfriend and want to have sex with me because I'm not like the jerks I hear them complain about. But it's still this persona. I'm a good guy. That should make people like me and love me. But the truth is not everybody's going to like us and love us. But the nice guy believes, well, but if I'm good, everybody should. So that there's, there's Colbert contract number one. And, and, and then, of course, what is, what is a, a good guy anyway? I'm a good guy. Well, that's, we're, we're the definer of that, right? We're the scorekeeper <laughs> yeah. of that. Uh, and then number two, uh, if I meet other people's needs without them having to ask, then they will meet my needs without me having to ask. Now, you mentioned the neediness of a nice guy. And this is true because nice guys and nice girls are not very good at taking responsibility for meeting their own needs. They use covert contracts. And, and this is called codependency. I'm going to give to you what I think you want or what will make you appreciate me or like me. And in return, you'll read my mind and know what I want and give back to me without me ever having to ask. Now, there's a lot of problems with this. <laughs> Number one, the other people don't know there's a contract. Like they don't know that they're supposed to be giving back because most people can't read minds, even though we nice guys think we can. Um, and nice guys and nice girls often pick people. You mentioned a past relationship. We pick people who are the least likely and least capable to be able to give to us and meet our needs. So like yeah. you said, if you pick a narcissist, what are the odds that a narcissist is going to be available to help you get your needs met? Nope. Ain't going to happen. <laughs> nope. And, and so there's this and, and it always comes out of this neediness. And as you said, neediness is repulsive. I tell that to men all the time. I said, you know, if, you, if you're approaching a woman and wanting her to approve of you and like you, that neediness will actually drive her away. Just like, you know, I'm walking oh, yeah, down yeah. the street here in Puerto Vallarta and some, somebody says, hey, friend, how you been? And I'm thinking, uh, no, stay away, right? That's just a, a natural response. Now, I'll tack one more piece onto this second covert contract. Because of our early conditioning, nice guys and nice girls are not very good at receiving. So when people do try to give to us, we're often really uncomfortable with that. We think we're doing something wrong. We're doing something bad. We're going to be in trouble. I mean, just a little example. Uh, my wife made some hard boiled eggs this morning after she finished working out. So we're sitting at the bar and she made me a plate of hard boiled eggs and we're sitting there and, um, and, she, and she puts hot sauce on hers, but she knows I like to put pepper on mine. And, you know, we're sitting there and she looks over and goes, oh, would you like pepper for your eggs? Now, my response, my, my, my gut response is, yeah, uh, and, and I'll, I'll get up and get it, you know, myself. And when she said, uh, I'll get it for you, I've learned to pause and let her give it to me because that gives her pleasure. It's her way of expressing love to me. Right. But if I say, no, 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 I can get it. Don't worry about it. You made the eggs, you know? So I've had to work at being a bad receiver and work at letting people give to me. And I still feel a little guilty about it. I still feel like I can get up and get the pepper. You know, you made the eggs. Why should I let you do more for me? But because she wants to, and if I tell her no, she actually feels unloved and feels, um, it, it takes away an avenue that she can express love to right. me. So learning to be a good receiver is actually in many situations, an act of love because it lets other people freely give. So, so because we nice guys aren't very good at it, we tend yeah. to pick people who aren't good at giving as well. Or, or when people do try to give, we don't let them. Do you think part of that, of not being able to receive the giving is that you're in that moment, you're not earning their love like you're now like lower down on the totem pole of earning it because I, I feel like for me I definitely the same tendencies um all growing up was like I'll do everything like everything yeah. you could ever want me to do I'll do for you you know and um that made me feel secure I felt like in that time I felt secure because I'm like they're definitely gonna love me because look at all these things I, that I'm I, doing I, yeah. for them. so and if that yeah. table gets flipped and I'm not earning it anymore now I'm running the risk of them not loving me anymore what what are they going to love me for if i'm not earning it you yeah, know so oh. <laughs> oh and even flip it and now now what am i going to owe them 
You know, what do I open now that <laughs> yeah. they did something to me? You know, I've worked around this, this issue with a lot of people. And that's, that's a really astute observation that if my sense of lovableness comes from doing and giving, and then I let somebody do or give to me, was my lovableness, right? Right. And, and so that, that's a big shift that recovering nice guys and nice girls had to work on. And there's other pieces tied into that as well. A lot of times that early decision we made as a, a child to be needless and wantless was because, as you said, with your mom, she was already emotionally overburdened. Mm -hmm. There were already other siblings. Uh, with my father, he was angry and critical and needy and demanding. So I didn't want to be like him. Or some people have a sibling that was sick or acting out and took a lot of family attention, or there's an alcoholic. So for many of us, we decided at an early age, I will be needless and wantless. And it may mean doing everything for everybody else, or it may just mean never having a need, just being invisible, basically. Um, so they, it gets manifested in, yeah. in a lot of ways for different reasons, but that is such a big core piece of nice guy, nice girl syndrome is trying to be needless and wantless and feeling guilty if we have needs, feeling like we're going to be in trouble if we ask someone to help or get a need met. But as you said, even thinking I'll get abandoned if yeah. I have needs. And yeah. I mean, all of that's really logical if you stand back from it. But it remember, it's wired into that emotional part of our brain that that still is every bit as powerful today as it was when we were three months old. So that it, it, it manifests in such subtle ways in, in every dynamic of every relationship we have. For example, and, and I teach several online classes and I have one that I teach for men and women and for work and careers called nice guys don't finish last. They rot in middle management. And I often give the homework assignment in that particular course for the next week. I give everybody the assignment um, three times a day. Ask somebody to do something for you that you can do yourself. Oof, love oh, it. Yeah, Ooh, this is excruciating. Uh, hey, while you're so up, good. will you grab me a coffee too? Or on your, on your way to the so copy, will, will, you, yeah. will you shoot some copies for me? Oh man, that's excruciating for the nice guy. Oh no, I can do it myself. Well, I'll get the pepper. I don't need you to. So, so good. So, so that's covert contract number two. Covert contract number three that is so common with nice guys and nice girls is that if I do everything right, then I will have a smooth problem-free life. And it's, so it's kind of like, hey, I, I've done it right. You know, I gave you everything you wanted. I've tried to make you happy. You know, I did all those reports. I did the extra credit. How come, you know, this still isn't going well? Or how come someone still got ahead of me and got, got advanced before me? Or how come you're not appreciating me? Or how come you're yelling at me? I've done everything right. You shouldn't ever be mad. And so that, that covert contract is, is really very childlike, Peter Panish. Oh, I'll do everything right. And the world would be this smooth, happy place. But unfortunately, number one, we can't do anything right. And, and again, who's the judge of that? Well, I did everything right. You know, even most of the world's, you know, main religious documents basically say nobody does it right. You know, everybody falls <laughs> right. short. But no, I'm, I'm superhuman. I do it right. And the other side of this coin is life is not smooth and problem free. Life's chaotic by nature. And when we can accept that piece, like, okay, life is chaotic by nature, and every challenge that I get presented with that, that challenges me, that gets me out of my comfort zone, that activate, they're gifts. They're all a gift to, to help me get out of my comfort zone and my standard ways of seeing the world and say, wait a minute, why is this happening? I don't want this to happen. I don't like this happening. But switch that to say, uh, all right, how can I love what's happening? How can I learn from it? How can I grow from it? How can I, how can I maximize and benefit from this thing that's happening, whether it's an illness, an end of a relationship, a death of a loved one, uh, a financial setback, a loss of a job, uh, coronavirus. Uh, I hope everybody listening has, because of coronavirus, has at, in some way turned it into a gift and, and activated something higher in their life because of something none of us want to be happening, but it is happening. How do we make the best of it and grow and put something of, of value out into the world because I, of it? 
Absolutely. And I love what you were saying about um, that last covert contract too, um, of doing everything right. <laughs> I can so relate. I definitely had like nice girl syndrome and like, I still have the tendrils of it every now and then too. I'm like, why am I doing, why, why am I making my 15 year olds toast? You make your own toast. Why am I, <laughs> why am I doing this? Um, uh, because you're but, a good mother and you do it right. Mom, Cause then I can yeah. have the good mom card. Yeah, exactly. exactly. And then just totally debilitate them and not let them learn their own life skills. <laughs> but, so i really yeah. have to work on that as a parent too. But you know, I found that when I was, so I was married for 13 years before and I've been divorced for about five years and I've done a ton of work on myself since then mm -hmm. but when I was married um I hadn't done any any of this work and what I what I remember back then was because I was always trying to earn love basically by doing everything right if he even hinted that I hadn't done something good enough or or right I was mm -hmm. super defensive and I realized now that that was because that literally felt like he was telling me that I was unlovable <laughs> yeah. and, so it and, was and, and probably that that he's going to leave you that, that you're going to be abandoned it, like I said I'm it's, like it's I emotional. try so hard yeah. <laughs> oh yeah I, I can't tell you how many times I've said you know what more can I do how how can I love you more how can I do what can I do to make you happy it's never enough you know? totally <laughs> totally I'm trying so hard and you don't even see it. it's total victim yeah. mindset totally, I was I totally. fully admit full victim mindset all all the time so I'm curious like I love this I love your one strategy that you shared of like making yourself ask someone else to do something for you huge because as a recovering nice girl I am like that is so good and I do do it now um I used to have shame about going to the gym when my kids were home you know like I should be doing mommy things for them instead right. and now I've shifted into this kitchen better be clean when I get home <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna, I'm I'm gonna, gonna let <laughs> you guys practice life skills yeah. while I'm away yeah. I'm going to the gym and make sure this is clean at 9 30 I'll be back it's got to be clean you know and so it's been such a wonderful shift um but what are some other strategies for recovering nice guys or nice girls that you have seen have been like really impacting because I I feel like if I was listening to this and I was still back then I'd be like dude I don't know how to get out of this like I don't yeah. even know where to start where do they where do you start well I, I'm gonna I'm gonna give two or three suggestions of where to start and then I then I want to do a little exercise. Oh yay. Messengers. We'll do a little homework. All right. Uh, so I'll tell them ahead of time, get a piece of paper and something to write with because you'll need it for the homework. Okay, great. Uh, and maybe maybe three pieces of paper even. So okay. So I, I began my own, I'll just call it quote, nice guy recovery in my mid 30s. I was in my second marriage. I'm, uh, my first two marriages began with me, total nice guy. I'll do everything to please you and get you to love me. And, and so about two, three years into my second marriage, my, my wife said to me, she said, I, you know, I, I can't take your nice guy, passive aggressive behavior anymore. And I'm thinking, mm -hmm. what, why am I being called out? I'm the one who does everything. You're the one who's moody and unhappy and angry and blah, 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 blah. And she said, you know, everybody thinks you're so nice, but you're not so nice to me. You can hurt me so bad. You know, and, and I, I had a PhD in marriage and family therapy at that time. And I'm not, I don't think I even knew what <laughs> passive aggressive meant. And, and she said, you know, you, you embarrass me in public. You say you'll do things and don't follow through. You'll make jokes that wow. hurt my feelings. Wow. And I'll just go, oh, well, you know, you're always unhappy. Well, you know, that's, that's, that's your thing. And, and, but she said, if you don't go get help, I'm leaving you. Well, I, I didn't want her to leave. And so I went to get help. And what I thought was going to get help meant how I wanted to go find out why me being a nice guy. Cause like you, I was proud of that. I'm a nice guy. I'm one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. How come everybody doesn't have that same life philosophy. And I went trying to figure out why me being a nice guy didn't make my wife happy and why it didn't make her want to have sex with me and why it didn't make her appreciate me. And luckily, luckily I fell into some good systems that really helped. And, and what first one I went to was a 12 step group because my wife kept saying, you're a sex addict. So I thought, well, okay. Went there and quickly found out I wasn't, I wasn't having enough sex to be a sex addict, but it was a group of guys who had some pretty messed up stuff in their life. And for the first time in my life, I grew up in a fundamental Christian church. My father was critical and judgmental. So I learned to hide. I grew up during the first, I'll call it the first wave of angry feminism that, you know, all men are jerks and, you know, you know, an erection's a sign of aggression. All men are assholes. My wow. mother trained me to be different from my father. So I'd gotten all these wow. messages, you know, just hide everything. And, and so I went to this 12 step group and I thought, Hey, 
I can talk about anything here. And I just started sharing everything about me that I'd never told anybody. Things I'd done, dark impulses, behaviors, awesome. mistakes. And, and it was like, I, this, this, this group met like at 6 a.m. in the morning. And I, I got excited about getting up to go to this group because for the first time in my life, I got to be real. I got to be me. I, I could just to say anything. And the only reaction I got was, thanks for sharing, Robert. You know, it, it wasn't like, oh, you're a terrible person or you're unlovable or you should go to hell and burn there for eternity. <laughs> you know, I didn't get any of that. Yeah. And that was liberating. Yeah. Then I started working with a therapist. And the very first session I had with this therapist was a woman therapist. And I don't know if she did this with every client she had for a session or she could see I needed it, but she taught me about boundaries in our very first session together. She put a string on the ground and started illustrating with me physically what boundaries look like in relationship. Wow. And again, I, I was in my second marriage in my mid thirties and already had a PhD in marriage and family therapy. I had no clue what boundaries were. I'd never heard of boundaries, wow. but they're essential for healthy relationships relationships are essential to let people get close to us. So I started learning about boundaries. And then I joined a men's group. And a lot of the focus of that was on sexual shame. And I began, you know, revealing all my sexual shame, especially that had piled up, you know, growing up in a fundamental yeah. Christian church and, mm -hmm. and, and just cultural shame and men are bad. And if men want sex, they're bad men. And oh, I, I, so here's what I would suggest for me really helped. And I think I always tell nice guys, nice girls, number one, go find safe people. You can't do this work by yourself. You said you had a coach that started helping reflect more accurate ways of thinking and being in the world. Yep. And we need that. Huge. So find a safe place to go start revealing you get more accurate feedback that, oh, no, you're not a bad person because you have needs or wants, or you're right. not a bad person because you make a mistake, or you're not a bad person because a relationship failed, you know, whatever. Start getting accurate feedback, start revealing you it with safe people. This can be a coach, a therapist, uh, a men's group, a women's group, 12-step group, uh, but find those safe people. I think that's essential. A second piece that I started working on was telling the truth, because as we've talked about, I was not honest. I, I, I just left out little pieces, you know, twisted mm -hmm. the truth a little bit, shared it this way. Mm -hmm. And, and so I started, I made it like me, my number one priority to start telling the truth. So what I started doing with, with my then wife was anytime I caught myself cooking up a little lie in my head. And by the way, I tell people, if, if you, if you are a nice guy or a nice girl, if you start listening, there is a little voice in there that says, tell it this way leave this part out. Oh, no, don't ask for that. They might get upset. No, don't tell them that you're going to do that because then you're going to have to defend yourself because, you know, that little voice just really coaches you through everything. And, and if you start listening to it, it's, it's pretty prominent. It's there all the time. So I started listening for that voice when, um, like, say, my, 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 then, my now ex, but my then wife would call me up at work and say, what time are you coming home? And I think, oh, she wants me home now. I better tell her uh, I'll be home at five because I think she wants me home now. Well, I know, I know I'm not going to leave my office by five. And my office was like 15 minutes oh, from my house. Man. And, and I thought I'll probably, I, I got stuff to do till like six. But I'd tell her what I thought she wanted to hear, right? <laughs> and without even knowing what she wanted to hear. But I thought that was my anxiety. So, so anyway, <laughs> I wouldn't get out of my office by five. So while I'm driving home, I'm concocting stories about why I'm not home at five. <laughs> oh, oh traffic. Oh, man. And then stoplights are like there are three cycles to get to a stoplight. And then there was like an accident. And you know, I'm just kind of just making it up, ripping as I go. <laughs> and and then when I get home, you know, and then, then they say, so what you said, you're gonna be home at five. Oh, man, you wouldn't believe the traffic. And really, I found out late, you know, what she didn't need me home at five. She just wanted to know what time I was coming home to know what time to have dinner ready. Right. Like, there was no agenda on her part. It was yeah, just like, no expectation. Hey, I, just want, I just want to know when, <laughs> when, when to expect you walking in the door. So what I started doing in that context to, to get more honest is I'd, I'd walk in the door and I, first thing I'd say to her is I'd say, I was going to lie to you. That's the first thing I'd say when I'd walk in the door, I'd say, I was going to lie to you. I said, when you called me, I knew I wouldn't be done by five o'clock. I knew I'd be leaving later than that. All the way here, I was rehearsing lies. Here's the lies I was rehearsing. I would tell her every, all that noise in my, I'd tell her all of that. And then I'd say, here's the truth of the matter. I didn't want you to be upset at me because I thought if I came home at six, you'd be upset. So I told you five o'clock, even though I knew I wouldn't make it home by five. So that's the whole story. Beautiful. And she usually just go, 
Oh man, that's crazy. Thanks for telling me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so learning, so, so finding safe people to release our shame and get accurate feedback, start working at telling the truth. And then I would say that maybe a third piece of that is what we've already talked about. Consciously start addressing your needs, that you are a human being. And as an adult, it is your job, your responsibility to start getting your needs met. Mm-hmm. And that, that's where I want to do a little, a little project. With All right, let's do it. We do it. Okay. So this is something that, that I call um, uh, cooperative reciprocal relationships. Now, as I just said, I believe, I mean, as children, we were dependent. We, we depended on adults and other caregivers to meet our needs. No matter how poorly they did it, we were dependent on them to do it. As adults, our, I, I think the number one definition of adulthood is responsibility, taking responsibility for your wants, your needs, your actions. So we are responsible for getting our needs met. Now, even as adults, we cannot meet them all by ourselves. It really takes a tribe for us to get our needs met. Mm. So this is such a powerful assignment because as we've already talked about, so many nice girls, nice guys have, have, have these have shame about having needs, right? I'm bad, I'm, 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 I'm unlovable. So here, I, t- I tell, I'll t- t- take the first piece of paper out that you have and draw a stick figure on it. And that stick figure is you. And draw like just a little bucket, just a little horseshoe container, like in the middle of you. That's, that's your bucket. That, that is your, your human needs reservoir, so to speak. Now, you, we all have needs. We have needs for food. We have need for sleep. We have need for companionship. We have need for accomplishment. We have, we have needs you know, to be happy. We have needs to you know, relax and spend time. I mean, we all have needs and wants. Let's not, let's not even worry about what's a need, what's a want. Let's just say that bucket needs to be filled regularly because there's a hole in the bottom of it that's constantly running out. So we need to constantly be filling that bucket with our needs and wants in order to not be needy, in order to feel lovable, in order to be love. Rather than us looking for love outside of us, we are going to be love. And children, according to M. Scott Peck in The Road Less Traveled, children internalize an emotional belief that they're lovable when their needs get met in timely, judicious, consistent ways. And I believe we adults are the same. That if we will take responsibility for filling our bucket up, and remember, everything's running out the bottom at the same time so we got to fill it faster than it runs out and if we will do that in consistent judicious and in uh timely ways we will feel loved and lovable as an internal state so outside the stick figure on this piece of paper i want you to draw about eight or ten circles and in between each of between you the stick figure and each of those circles draw a little two-ended arrow where the arrow points towards the circle and towards you this is the reciprocal part everybody and what i say everybody in this relationship is getting something of value out of the relationship and each of those circles represents a person a professional a practice you have in your life, a hobby, a group. So I I would, somebody asked me one time, well, how many of these circles should we have? And I go, I don't know, shoot for a hundred. And people go, a hundred? I go, yeah. But every friend you have in a circle, uh, every professional you have, your personal trainer, your coach, your accountant, your attorney, um, put any groups that you're a part of, put any practices and hobbies you have, your meditation, your exercise. Fill the, the, the more of those circles we have operating in our life, the fuller our bucket's going to be. The less needy we'll be, the more filled, fulfilled, loving, loved. So page one of this exercise, there's three pages. So page one, I, I ask people to identify and every, every, as many of the circles as they can, can identify in their life. I say it can be family, every friend give them their own circle. Don't just have one circle for friends. Cause like, for example, you may put a friend and you go, I haven't talked to that friend in two years. And then you go, I need to call them. I need to drop them a line. So putting their name there reminds you that to activate it. Very cool. Okay. So there's page one. And and I like doing this in workshops and groups and then having people share some of those circles because people go, oh yeah, I forgot about my, my personal trainer. Oh yeah. I forgot about my accountant. Uh, Mm. Oh yeah. I forgot about, you know, my cousin, you know, I, 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 who I haven't talked to. So, so that's, that's page one. Okay. And this is just to make us aware. What resources do we have right now? Page two, 
We're going to draw the same stick figure, the same bucket inside. And the, this, the diagram is going to look the same, but page two is going to be cooperative reciprocal relationships. We can just call them CRRs if we want, uh, that we want to add to our life. I did this uh, assignment about three years ago in a, a workshop I was leading. And I said, I, 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 I want a men's group that I can be in. I need to change accountants and I need a financial advisor. And uh, one guy in the program said, well, I've been in this men's group led by this person, blah, blah, blah. I go, tell me, I, I, I'm, I've, been, I've now been in that men's program for three years. Since Beautiful. Then. I found a new accountant. I, a financial advisor found me. Somebody approached me at a different workshop I was teaching saying, you've changed my life. I want to help change your life. And, and he's been my financial advisor for two or three years now. So I identified, what do I need? Now it might be, I need an exercise practice. I need a personal trainer. I need a coach. I need a, um, I, I need an accountability group to keep me accountable for whatever I struggle with, whether it be addiction or, or finances or exercise, or I need an accountability group. So page two is what you need to add to your life to make page one fuller and more complete so that your bucket's constantly getting full. And can you see this practice is very conscious. It's very, yeah. it's us taking responsibility for us and inviting people who want to be there. Either we pay them. You and I right now have a cooperative reciprocal relationship. We are both giving to each other and getting value from the yeah. other. Now, here's the thing about them. And this is going to lead to page three. Page three, draw another stick figure. And now the circles on page three are going to be the, the maybe not so cooperative or not so reciprocal relationships that we have in our life. Mm. It could be a family member. It could be an ex. It could be what used to be our best friend. It could be an accountant that we don't, you know, doesn't serve us well. These are the, are the, are the circles we either need to uh, renegotiate show up differently in a very conscious way or completely prune and remove from our life to make room to, to add other cooper truly cooperative, truly reciprocal relationships that bless our life and bless the other people's life. Now, like I said, this could even include people we pay. It can include your accountant, your coach, blah, blah, blah. But everybody in there, you know, I've got clients, you've got clients and they pay us. Well, they, they get value out of what we give to them and we get value because we can make our house and car payment because they pay us. So, but it's all cooperative and it's all reciprocal. Now, in my experience, when people sit down and do this, and because I do it in a lot of workshops, I, I do it a few times a year, but I tell people do this at least twice a year, every six months, um, you know, whether it's the, you know, the, the solstice or, you know, whatever, uh, you know, when daylight saving time changes, you know, do sit down and get out three pieces of paper and say, what do I have in my life? What do I need to add to my life? What needs renegotiated, paired back, eliminated, or I just show up differently. And I promise you, this is one of the most, it's a simple tool, but it is so powerful in, in filling our bucket up, making us more attractive to the world because needy is not attractive. Okay. Fill and, full and overflowing is amazingly attractive. And I say it makes us attractive, not just to the opposite sex, but to, to opportunity, adventure, money, everything that's not nailed down out there in the world. Everything's just floating around. I believe it's polarized and drawn to us. When we're needy and trying to make things happen, it like pushes it away. Yep. So, so yeah, uh, if I can get people to do this twice a year, it's life, it's life changing. Yeah. I was thinking like twice a year stuff. I like to do like new year's day and 4th of July here in the U S are kind of cool reminder holidays for me about like halfway points through the year. Um, but I, what I love about what you're saying here, and I, I talk to my clients about this all the time. I'm like, do you understand how powerful it is to do a worksheet, to put a pen on a piece of paper mm -hmm. and to work some things out? It's so underrated, but I'm like, I have gone to some really high level masterminds. I have worked with really high level coaches. And you know what they have you do? 
that what you just said, write, put, take, take out a pen and a piece yeah. of paper and actually write some things down. It's part of my morning routine. I know it's part of your life. It, otherwise I feel like we never get to the root of anything. We stay on this very surface level. Like I kind of know why I'm passive aggressive. Cause I have like pleasing stuff from childhood. Okay. <laughs> well, you just didn't get anywhere. Like that didn't really actually change anything in your life. So I love that you're encouraging us to, and I, I took like extensive notes, guys. I'll put them in the show notes because I want to make sure that you guys could have that as a resource. But like um, being able to slow down one, the pause that's created from actually having to put a piece of a, a pen mm-hmm. to a piece of paper. Um, and then for us to visually feel while we're slowing down and see what's happening in our lives is super powerful. So I love, I love that strategy. And I hope that you guys will do that. If you're listening, like if this stuff is resonating with you, cause some of the most profound shifts that have happened in my life purely come from writing something down, like taking five minutes, 10 minutes out of my day to completely change my life. So I, I love that strategy. And then I wanted to also kind of hit on, um, when you were talking about your, your group, your, uh, AA group or whatever, you know, your, (laughs) your addiction group that you went to, um, not AA, but (laughs) uh, well, it it, it was same methodology. Yeah. It was a 12 step program. Yeah. Yeah. And I love what you said there because I know, you know, Brene Brown, who I'm sure you're familiar with too, who does shame research. Um, she talks about how in order for us to get past shame, we have to be able to have a safe space in which to share our true feelings with someone that we know that that can be shared and it's going to be received without judgment and with compassion. And so I like, I love that tip because that's for me, um, I had like sexual abuse as a little girl that I had never dealt with. And I know there's so many people like that where it's just like, if I just kind of like tell myself, I forgive the person and then don't think about it. Like, it's just that I don't have, I don't have to ever deal with this (laughs) and I don't ever have to think about it or feel it ever again. And after my divorce, after leaving, I also was raised, you know, LDS Mormon. And so like, there were so many layers of shame and um, secrecy and just trying to put stuff under the rug and never really actually look at it. And when I went through my divorce and basically, honestly, a true personal awakening phase, all of that came out, you know, and for me, that was also the beginning of being able to get out of these behaviors, because until I was willing to actually voice all the things I was never voicing, I couldn't, I also couldn't see the patterns that have been created in my life because of it. So I love that. I love that piece of advice of like really starting out, like find safe people and yes. start getting your true feelings out. Cause you're exactly right. Like when you're a people pleaser or codependent or a nice guy or a nice girl, you only feel, I only felt safe sharing things that I felt like would still make people like me right? (laughs) Because if I share this part of it, they won't like me. So don't share that part, the part where all the meat and potatoes is just share the victim-y stuff. The victim-y stuff's cool, but any shadow stuff, I'm not sharing that because then they might not like me. (laughs) All right. So I, I, I gotta, I gotta share an illustration because I, 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 man, I hundred percent, what you're saying is, is so powerful. And again, I said, we can't do this alone. We need safe people to give us to both release the things that we, we keep hidden that we don't even know we're hiding it. Right? Yeah. Right. And to get more accurate feedback. So I'll give an example. This was really early in my own recovery process. I was in that 12 step program that I mentioned. I was seeing a therapist and um, as, as a nice guy, you know, I, I, I just repress any dark impulses. You know, I just, Oh, they're, they're, you know, I, 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 I don't even want to look to see what might be down right. here. Yep. And I remember I'd started doing my this work. And as you know, when you start doing this work, stuff comes bubbling up, right? Uh-huh. You know, old memories and old feelings and old, oh my God, that's in there. Yep. Um, and yeah. and I, I had a, a dark sexual impulse like come up and, and you know, and it was really strong and, and I didn't act on it, but I had a lot of shame about even just, you know, entertaining this, this dark impulse. And so I went to my 12-step group. And, you know, that was a really safe place. It was all guys. And I mean, they were, they were sharing far darker stuff than I could come up. But, and so I shared it there. And I, 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 I just gave the vivid detail of, of the impulse. And, you know, I got done and everybody just kind of looks at me and says, well, thanks for sharing, Robert. And go, 
oh, okay, I wasn't terrible. <laughs> uh, no, nobody thought I was terrible. Nobody, nobody even had weird looks on their faces yeah. while I was telling it. <laughs> then I, I happened to have an appointment with my therapist. Now, like I said, it was a woman therapist, and like an hour after this group meeting. So I went and I sat down and I, I, I told her, man, this is not stuff I would have told anybody in the past. And so I told my therapist, and this was fairly early on in, in therapy with her. And, she, you know, I tell her this really dark impulse that made me feel really bad about myself. And she just kind of looks at me with a look of compassion and said, well, let's dive into that. Let's see what the story is behind that. I'm going, oh, that's it. <laughs> that's, 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 that's all the reaction I'm going to get. And so we, then we right. explored it, right? We explored what it was. So I'm driving home. Now, I used to tell my second wife that her middle name ought to be overreact because that's what she did in every situation. And so I'm driving home thinking, I, I need to tell my wife this, impulse, this this story. And I thought, oh my, you know, knowing her, who knows, you know, the, if, if, you know, if the house is going to get blown apart, the roof's going to come down. What? And I thought, but hey, I'm batting a thousand. I'm two for two. Nobody's gone ballistic on this. Uh, even if she does go ballistic, I'm still batting 666. I'm all right. So I went home, got home from my session and she was at home and I said, um, uh, come in the bedroom, come sit down. I, I need to tell you something. And we sat down on the bed. I told her the, what the impulse was and, and how powerful it had felt and how much it scared me. And I said, I shared it with my 12 step group and I shared it with my therapist. And, um, and, and she just looked at me, no reaction. And just said, um, that, that does kind of scare me. She goes, it doesn't surprise me. And she said, I'm glad you talked about it with your group and your therapist. And she never brought it up again. And I'm thinking, wow, that's a thousand, <laughs> three for three. That when I took the risk of being vulnerable and sharing shame. Now, I tell people, this is good to practice with your safe people yeah. before you go tell the other people that don't feel quite as safe, like yeah. your partner who you're afraid might leave you or right. a family member or you know anybody judgmental in your life. Tell it to your safe people. And then I felt safe enough to go tell it to somebody who I th thought th there was a great potential of her having a pretty big negative reaction to it, right? And she didn't because I had already worked through, I'd already, I don't say I worked through it, but I'd already gotten out the, the most yeah. intense part of it with my safe people. And I could just share it to her. It's just facts, just information. Yeah. Right? And, uh, and she could just hear it as that. So yeah, I just, man, I just want to, you know, really support people listening. Get I love people. I love that so much. You know, my very first podcast interview was with um, Amber Sears, who's JP Sears, his wife. And I don't know if you know JP, but he's a comedian. And he does a lot of stuff on YouTube. He's, mm -hmm. he's wonderful. But his wife um, shared how she had bulimia for so many, for like her whole life, basically. She was mm -hmm. a dancer as a teenager. And here she was an adult and she was in a committed relationship. It was before JP, but she was in a committed relationship and was hiding this bulimia from her partner. And she said the thing that finally got her past it was just telling, <laughs> just yeah. telling her partner that she was doing it. And then she went on her radical healing journey. And when I hear you share this, that you are able to open up little by little, like super safe. And then like the therapist, pretty safe too. And then now we can start to get it. Like to me, all I hear is um, coming together in your relationship. Like I imagine that that would be way more um, bonding and relationship building instead of divisive, because now yeah. you both understand understand what's going on. So if something comes up with that in the future, it's like, ah, oh, we both understand how that might affect you or how you, you know, how are you feeling with that? Like, because that little trigger happened or whatever. And so now you've come together instead of you having this like deep, dark secret that I hope she never finds out that I ever had a thought like that, you know? So exactly. it's like, it's so I always say, um, speak it to release it, you know, speaking it, it's like, it just stays in your psyche forever until you have a safe space in which you can speak it. And I, so I love that story. And I think, you know, like it reminds me of your first story of saying like, Hey, I was making up a bunch of <laughs> lies <laughs> about traffic because I was scared. You'd be mad at me. And that's, that's also relationship building. It's like, Oh, yeah. that's where your heart was. I thought you were just being a jerk and like not putting me first and you didn't care about me, but actually you cared about me so much <laughs> that you were doing. All yeah, you were going to lie to me. You love me so much. You were going to lie to me. Please me. <laughs> yeah. So it's like always so much more, um, bonding. I think when we can, when we can 
actually share what's coming from our souls, but it's so scary to do that, that our society is not set up that way. You know, you live in Mexico. So I, I think you've probably seen this, but one of the things I love about Hispanic people that I know is they have much less of a filter on that. Like they can mm-hmm. share things a little bit more openly, at least my Hispanic friends that I have. And I so appreciate that. I'm like, oh, there's no like shame here. There's not as much of a filter of like, I can't tell anything real that's happening in myself. Like but my Hispanic friends are a little more free with sharing those things. I think yeah. it's so, so healthy. Um, and I hope that we can all work towards like being the um, like generation changers on that in our lives of like, I'm not going to just sit in shame and silence and be miserable my whole life. Like I'm actually going to open up and, and share. And I think your tip on doing that in a safe place first, and then kind of <laughs> gradually working your way into the more vulnerable situations is, is so beautiful. Um, I guess we'll go ahead and wrap this up. Cause I don't want to keep you more than an hour. I so appreciate you sharing this with us today. This has been really impacting for me. And I know so many people listening are going to get so much out of this. And so I just want to share you guys, his book is called no more, Mr. Nice guy, a proven plan for getting what you want in love, sex, and life. And then where else, like, how else can they partake of your, you, you said you have some coaching uh, groups or what, how else like, can they partake of what you have uh, to offer? To partake of, yes. of my offerings. Yes. <laughs> uh, I'm easy to find it. Just think my website is drglover.com, just D-R-G-L-O-V-E-R.com. If they Google Robert Glover, if they Google No More Mr. Nice Guy, I got like the top 10 spots on, on every yeah. page. Um, and yeah, I've got, I've got an online university with some self-help courses. I do workshops and seminars. I got a bunch of podcasts on my website. Um, it's just, yeah, go check it out. And, and do um, you still coach people one-on-one as well? I do on a very limited basis. Okay. I, I limit it to, to maybe about four or five people at a time. And, and, and I, I, I do a deep dive with my clients. They've got to sign up for an extended amount yeah. of, of sessions and time. And I give them a concierge service where they can contact me anytime on WhatsApp or email. And we, and we go deep. And, and I, I really love doing it that way. Very so cool. um, so the, 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 that is also an option for those who might be interested. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. And I'll link all of that in the show notes, you guys. And um, again, Robert, thank you so much for doing this work, for expanding outside of just your normal realm of, of education and really diving into your own journey so that you can bring this to all of us. Cause it's so needed. <laughs> There's so many of us women too, who can relate to it. So thank you so much. Tara, thank you for the information. This was fun. I had a great time.